I've uh, been reviewing and going through the daily insights playlist and finishing the fundamentals, trying to thumb through the online reference book. It looks like it's necessary to memorize all the efficiencies, like for pumps and cooling towers and compressors, coils, et cetera. I can't find them via searches in the reference book. Is this the case? And if there is a list of them to memorize anywhere, I've started making flashcards and trying to make sure I'm not going through useless memorization as I'm really trying to focus on comprehension and retention as I go through the material. I really like this question, um, especially the second paragraph there, focusing on at, at least I, I happen to know this candidate is uh, at the beginning of the process. So that's the right approach, focusing on comprehension, comprehension and retention at the beginning when you're going through fundamentals and daily insights. Later on down the road, when you're solving problems, then yes, it's going to be important to pull out certain formulas at the right time. And that might mean finding them in the reference handbook. And that might mean just knowing what those efficiencies are. And some of that comes from problem solving experience. So I thought we'd take just a couple minutes now, since that's kind of a general answer, to go through some of the most frequently used efficiency formulas. Some of these you'll find explicitly in the reference handbook. Other ones you may not. But even if you're not finding them on a lookup, I would expect you to kind of have these ingrained in you, not initially, but after you go through the six practice modules, by the time you're doing those two full practice tests at the end, these are things that should kind of just come you know, organically to you uh, in, in the midst of solving that problem. So these are just, I don't know, half a dozen that I kind of pulled off, uh, off of that list that you gave here, pumps, cooling towers, compressors, et cetera. So let's start with pumps. Efficiency of a pump is the hydraulic horsepower or water horsepower divided by the brake horsepower, the power of a spinning shaft. And then analogous to that, we have the efficiency of a fan, which is the air horsepower over brake horsepower. And then for both of those, we can say that the power of a pump set or the total efficiency, not the power the efficiency, is the product of this efficiency, the efficiency of the pump, and the efficiency of the motor that's driving that pump. So we'll call that N sub T for total, or you can say the overall efficiency of the pump set is the efficiency of the motor times the efficiency of the pump. You hear me talk a lot about this in practice problems that cause you to make a decision as to whether you're gonna deal with the efficiency of just the pump section or the overall total efficiency. And then the same can be said for a fan. You can have the total efficiency of a fan uh, with its motor, and that would be the efficiency of the motor times the efficiency of the fan. And then cooling towers. Cooling towers, sometimes you say it's efficiency. Sometimes you say it's effectiveness. I don't know, I, people get confused and I think the terminology gets thrown around, but um, suffice it to say that the reference handbook uses this kind of sigma for cooling towers. So we'll just use the same nomenclature they do. And what is the effectiveness of a cooling tower? It's the amount of reduction in condenser water temperature that you're actually getting, the range as compared to what you could be getting, which is the difference between the temperature of the water that's entering and the outside wet bulb on that particular day. So entering water temperature minus leaving water temperature divided by the same thing, entering water temperature, because that is what you're starting with, minus the outside wet bulb temperature. Or another way to say the same thing is the range or the condenser water delta T, and the sum of the range and the approach. The range is simply the delta T, right? The approach is the difference between the leaving water temperature, leaving the tower, and the outside wet bulb, right? It's the difference between what you're getting and what you could be getting. And if you 
you know, make those substitutions and do the algebra, you'll find that that leads right back to this. And just to give you the maximum flexibility here in terms of terminology, if you don't want to think about it as entering and leaving, you can say that the leaving water temperature, the leaving water is the condenser water supply. It's being supplied by the cooling tower to the water cooled chiller. And the entering water temperature is the condenser water return. It's being returned to the cooling tower to be cooled. And then how about coils? If you have something like a cooling coil in an air handling unit um, or really any you know, fan coil unit, anything with a coil, or even if you have uh, like an air washer type situation, then you can define the efficiency of a coil talking about the air side now. This can be defined as the entering air temperature minus the leaving air temperature divided by same thing, entering air temperature. But now instead of leaving air, it's what the leaving air could be, which is to say it could be reduced all the way to the surface temperature of the coil, what we call the apparatus dew point. So a 100% efficient coil would, in theory, reduce the leaving air temperature all the way to the apparatus dew point. Of course, that never happens uh, in, in reality, but oftentimes in problem solving, we assume that it does. We assume it's a perfectly efficient coil unless there's some specific reason not to or more information given. Another way of expressing the coil efficiency is this idea of a bypass factor where the bypass factor is one minus the coil efficiency. And a couple more that came to mind uh, as listed there in your question were compressors and turbines. So let's touch on those as well. For a compressor, Let's draw for a moment before we write the actual formula. What's happening on a pH diagram for a compressor? We have a situation where we want to increase the pressure. That's what a compressor does from state one to state two. So if that's the case, we would hope to um, pay a certain cost in terms of the change in enthalpy from one to two, we would expect to pay that, that cost in energy in order to increase the pressure from state one to state two. But in reality, it takes even more energy to get to the desired pressure than we would hope. So we can define this location as two prime. So the ideal case is going from one to two, but reality is going from one to two prime. So then the efficiency of a compressor is H2 minus H1, which is smaller than H2 prime minus H1, which is larger. So the thing that we wanna get out of a compressor is the increase in pressure. And we'd like to pay as little as possible for the benefit of doing that, but unfortunately, we have to pay more. It's always the opposite of what you want as efficiencies go down. Now with a turbine, we'll find that it's, it goes the other way. So again on pH, if we have, um, we're, we're expanding, right? So we're reducing the pressure or increasing the specific volume. We're going from state one to state two ideally. But in actuality, we don't get as much energy out as we would like. So we end up somewhere like this, two prime. Now don't get confused by the ones and twos. This is why I don't want you to memorize. I want you to <laughs> get the concept here. And remember this idea that you always get less than what you would have wanted. What you want from, com uh, from a compressor is to pay as little as possible, but you have to pay more, more enthalpy. In, when you go to two prime. When it's a turbine, you're gonna get that expansion, you're gonna get that reduction in pressure, and you'd like to get as much energy out of the process as possible because the turbine's producing power, but you get less than you could. So what does that mean then 
for the efficiency of a turbine. It's H1 minus H2 prime, which is smaller than H1 minus H2. So those are just some highlights. And, and, you know, these are some ones that came to mind. I'm sure I'm missing a couple. And, you know, if you want me to go over any others on another occasion, we can certainly do that. But um, yeah, again, at the beginning, if you're early in the process, comprehension and retention, don't worry about memorizing these. Just know that they exist and be ready to pull them out when you need them. If you're later in the process and anything I said here is like uh, not, <laughs> not something you have seen, then that's that's not good, right? Then you want to kind of go back and say, all right, where did I have an opportunity to cover these ideas and, you know, find those practice problems and make sure to hit those again. Great question.